All right. So, today, we're going to talk about our textbook. So, if we look at... Uh, if we look at our lives and try to divine it spiritually, we would say this. The Holy Spirit's our teacher. The Bible's our textbook. And life is our test. And some of you guys have walked in maybe thinking that you failed the big exam. But the fact is, is that once Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you can never be a failure even though you fail. How powerful is that? Very powerful because you know what we live in? We live in a society that really, really likes to focus on failure. And here's the truth of that. If we focus on failure, that's what we'll become. Do you know that? All right. So turn in your Bibles. Turn in your textbook to 2 Timothy. We're going to Describe 2 Timothy, and Lord willing, I'll get to Psalms 119 uh, subsequent to that. 2 Timothy, <coughs> chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And it reads like this. I, I need glasses again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. Wow. How do you want to know? How do you guys want to be complete? What do we use to complete us, to keep us on the right track? The Bible. So our memory verse is actually taken from Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and Spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about our textbook or standard for living. That's what the Bible is. How are we going to understand the things of God unless the Holy Spirit reveals them to us? To what's His baseline for doing so? All right. The Bible is a spiritual book. Prophecy came as men spoke. When they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Okay, now it gets a little lively. You know how powerful the Word of God is? This is how powerful the Word of God is. Okay? When Lazarus was in the tomb, dead. Jesus didn't go in there. He sent His Word in there. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got from the grave and came out of the tomb. And Paul, Paul said this, I didn't come to the Corinthian church. In word only. But I wanted to see the power that the word produced in the Corinthian church. See, the word of God is powerful. It's able to change us. It's a spiritual book. And we need spiritual translation to understand it. Now, was the Bible beneficial to unbelievers? Yes. Because Todd mentioned this morning, when you perform spiritual principles or biblical principles, there is truth attached to that, correct? And that truth will bless the person who does it. But it doesn't mean that they understand spiritual matters. So, when we read the Bible, we understand that it was written not by man, but the author is God. And why do we study Scripture? To know the author. Why do we study Scripture? To know the author. To know who God is. To know the standards He has set for us. To understand how to live a biblical life overpowering life in Jesus Christ. The problem is, is that we have people that confess Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. The reason why they don't know Jesus is they haven't learned Jesus. What's our, what's our um, mission statement? Learn, love, and live Jesus. And I think that is a progression, right? How can you love somebody you don't know? Huh? How can you love somebody you don't know? It's the same spiritually. How can you love God if you don't know Him? So, it's a spiritual book. Jesus said that my words are spirit and they are life. So, the transformation that comes to a believer is when they take the Word of God and they apply it to themselves. 
and it will transform you because now you're living in God's standard, not yours. So you know what really helped me? When I quit going to the sermon and letting the pastor give me the word for the week. Does that sound so harsh? But that's what changed my life. I went to the pastor. I started getting in the Bible myself. And I went to the pastor. I went to church service. And what church service did for me is it confirmed what I've been learning all week long when I heard the pastor get up and preach the very things I was learning. And then God was not just somebody I saw on Sunday. He wasn't long distance. He was here with me attached. And He was walking through life with me. You know why the Bible's living? Because it doesn't just stop the day you read it. It continues on with you as you live your life and there's new descriptions of what you're going through found in the Word of God. So it's alive. These principles are there all the time. That's why it's so powerful. It's powerful. So, 2 Peter, I love this, it says, Men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And this is prophecy he's talking about. So God moved upon men and they wrote down what he inspired them to do. And that writing down is what we benefit from today as we look and see what God has to say about life. We like to say, and people say, well, men, men wrote the Bible. No, God wrote the Bible. He used men to pen it. Okay? Okay. So, it's a spiritual book. Its principles are everlasting. Its principles are everlasting. What's changed then? Only language, not the principles. Do you know this? There's over 5,800 handwritten Greek manuscripts that they found. I think up to the, what, 4th century? 5,800. Many people didn't even know Greek. Many of them were scholars. And the differences found in those documents, on a small scale, they might seem big. But if I give you something to copy and you give it to somebody else, how many people is it going to pass through before the substance has changed tremendously? Oh, man, not very much. 5,800 copies written over hundreds of years, and the substance has never changed, even with, even with, the, with the frailty of man, and it still shows that it's God who's the author. That's why there's agreement. I don't know about you, but if I was writing a book about myself, I wouldn't down myself. Am I going to tell you all the little dirty little secrets that's going on in me if I was writing about myself? No. Because we're going to make it look better, aren't we? We're like fishermen. We're going to tell a story that the fish was what? Well, we're going to add to it, correct? You know the Bible? The Bible doesn't glorify man at all. It doesn't glorify man at all, does it? That's how you know who wrote it. That's how you know who wrote it. Because if I'm writing about me, you're going to know how good I am. Don't ask my wife. You can come and talk to me. Man does not live by, on bread alone, but on every word that comes from who? God. This is what Jesus told Satan when he was lying to him in the wilderness. How many guys have ever had your life built up on lies? How many guys had that lie start early in, in, uh, in your age? Toddler. Heard things that weren't true. And then pretty soon you started living that way. You know what the Bible does? It corrects all those lies. And Jesus told Satan when he was being tempted, Hey, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What's he talking about? Spiritual life. Physical life ceases. Do you know that? Fear, physical life ceases for everyone. Physical life ceases for everyone. Only spiritual life continues for those who believe. Spiritual death continues for those who don't. What, what are you going to feed your spiritual life with? Hmm? You know what the Bible says? Give us this day our, our daily dose of God found in the clarity of His Word. I'll get to that in a second. The Bible is our textbook that gives us a standard for spiritual living. 
or spiritual standard for spiritual living. All scripture is profitable that the man of God would be complete. 2 Timothy 3.16. So what's it do? It gives us a standard, a baseline of how God speaks. Do you know, and here's what I want you guys to clearly understand. God speaks clearly. God speaks clearly in the Bible. So if it's clear in the Bible, do you need to second guess what it's describing? No. If it's clear in Scripture, the whole thing about communication in God, what we're talking about is God communicating with man. Do you know that? That's what we're saying. I need a word from God. Well, where's the clearest word that's going to come? It's found from His standard or His Scripture. Every other word that comes from God is based on this. Woo! I need to get some people awake this morning. Every other word from God is only clear compared to the clear teaching of Scripture. And if the Bible is clear about things, we don't need another opinion. Ooh, did I say that right? I did, huh? If the Bible is clear about sin, you don't need to go around trying to find another opinion about it. And the problem is, is that we got preachers and people telling people other things, but not the clear word of God. And we're building their lives up by another standard, not God's. Here's the thing. When we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about God's Word, right? Let's put it in a, in a real way. How about God's way of communicating? That's how God communicates with man. You know what God's creative uh, principle came from? His Word. He spoke it. Well, we have it documented, documented for us to understand that it's God speaking. And here's, here's my point. Ready? More importantly than what is being said, the Bible will give us an accurate or a clear picture on who's saying it. More importantly than what's being said, the Bible gives us a clear picture of who is speaking, whether it's God, this world, or Satan. That's very important to know. This is why the Bible says, test the spirits. This is why the Bible says, line up everything with Scripture and cast everything else out. This is why you're to hold your thoughts captive and line them up with the truth because the Bible clearly gives us God's standard and how He speaks and who He is and all those things. Everything else is twisted by the enemy. Now, notice I said a clear picture on who's saying it, not what's being said. Some of these things we can't understand. And we're looking to understand them before we follow. Does that make sense? I'm looking to understand God's Word before I follow it. I had to perform a lot of duties as an employee uh, when I didn't understand why the boss told me to do it. So understanding it doesn't... Having to understand what's being said doesn't mean that you need to wait for that understanding before you're obedient. Understanding the clear truth of God should drive you to obedience. There's a big difference. I had to perform functions. My boss said, do this. And my first words is, why? Why? Why would I want to do that? Well, he had a reason that I couldn't understand. So did I need understanding before I could follow through in obedience? No. No, I didn't need understanding before I could follow through in obedience. I just need to know what was clearly said so I could follow through. Does that make sense? So then once I understood what was clearly said, then I could follow through. So what happens in those gray areas of life? Do you know the Bible doesn't detail everything about God? It doesn't. And, and this is what it does. It tells us who God is and what He expects. But it doesn't detail everything about God. How do you know that? Because in John it says that if everything was even written about Jesus, the whole world could contain the information. So how can the, the whole universe doesn't even contain all the information about God? Because God's far superior to the, to the created universe that He put in place. But what the Bible does give us is gives a standard. It gives us a baseline for which we can measure life. How do we measure life without God? We measure life in comparison. Comparison to what? Comparison to other people. Then truth is relative. Relative to how I see it, not relative to what it is. Come on, I'm preaching truth now. And then I begin to live my life any way I want to, and I don't care the results. 
And here's the truth. If society was built up on that and God wasn't holding together, we would tear one another apart and there wouldn't be anything left. That's the truth and reality. So that declares the truth of God. Okay? How else is it my standard? Well, I line my life up by it. And it reveals the reality of God, not my perception. There's a big difference. Your perception is not your reality. What you think you see is not necessarily reality. Right? Construction people, you go out there and you go to measure something and you say, I perceive it's going to measure this, right? And if you built a house based on your perception, how square would it be? Oh, that's a good one. If you built a house based on your perception, how square would it be? No, you need something to measure it against, right? That's exactly what the Bible provides, a measuring line for us in the fact that this is the way God speaks, this is who he is, and this is who we are, and this is the direction we need to head. It frees us up so that we're not living in this reality, we're living in his. This is why faith is so important. You know why faith is so important? Because you see life from faith, which means seeing life from God's perspective instead of your own. Well, this is, this is powerful. Why? Because what looks like a problem to me in my perspective is only an opportunity in God's. Woo! <laughs> Getting some people going this morning. Because now I'm not controlled by everything I see. This is why faith is so important. Faith moves on the promises of God, not everything that you see. So what looks like a problem, what looks like a hindrance, what looks like, <laughs> what looks like there's a place with no hope, God can bring hope and He can bring new life. This is why we come together on Sundays. This is why the body comes together. Not just to tell the rules of God, but tell the reality of God, what God can do in, 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 in uh, dire circumstances. What God can do when there's no other hope. This is why the body of Christ comes together so we can declare His promises and His righteousness and His power in this dark and lonely world. So that when people come in with the weight of the world, we can see those chains broken in Jesus' name. That's why the church comes together to lift Him up. To lift Him up. I don't want to hear about, about the problems as much as I want to hear about the solution. Jesus is the solution. There's always hope when there's no hope. There's always a way when there's no way. Oh, it sounds like a song we sing. We do sing that song from time to time. And you know what the song, the, re the next lyric says? And I believe God, you'll do it again. Do you know why he says you can, you know why he says in, uh, in Revelation to the church at Ephesus to go back to your first love? You know why he tells them to go back to their first love? Here's the truth. So, because they can. You can be renewed in that fire. You can be renewed in that purpose. You can be renewed in the love of God where nothing else matters. And this is what I'm speaking to too many people that have been sitting in church so long. They come to church as a matter of habit because you're not renewed in Jesus Christ. That renewal can change everything. Last week we talked about spiritual gifts. We have a lot of people that are conservative in nature. I had a guy that comes, that goes to Lutheran Church that happened to come up here this Sunday, and he ran to me and goes right on. I'm thinking, whoa, I'm kind of amazed because I know they don't teach the spiritual gifts like we do here. But here's the purpose. With Christ, with the Holy Spirit, those spiritual gifts aren't a div di place of division. You know what they're a place of? Hope, because God is supernatural and he's bringing hope to this place. What about, what about chaos? What about the confusion these spiritual gifts bring? Why do you think we're teaching on the Word? Because the Word structures our lives so that we don't get out of bounds. It's our structure. How do I see it? Well, I see you need the Word and you need the movement of the Holy Spirit. The Word's the structure. You ever seen a kid do well without structure? Neither have I. Right? You ever seen a kid perform well without discipline? Neither have I. It's a good thing the kids aren't in here. They wouldn't like that one. <laughs> you ever seen an adult function well without discipline? No, neither have I. The Word provides our structure so that we're not led astray. And oftentimes what happens is when the Holy Spirit moves, if we're not structuring the Word, the focus gets off to spiritual gifts and then people get chaotic and crazy and they have no solid substance in their life. 
I need the word to stand on. You know the word is my baseline? The word is my platform where I can stand solid and secure and I shall not be moved because the word doesn't change. You know how important that is to a teenager when their whole lives are changing on a constant basis because family issues and emotions and friends that you can give them something solid that never changes? That's powerful. There's two things I found out in dealing with kids. I'm really good with kids. I'm really good with other people's kids. Better than my own, but I'm really good with kids. This is what I found out. There's two things that are required. Caring. You have to be caring with teenagers. They have to know you care. If they don't know you care, they'll write you off in a heartbeat. They'll just go through the motions, tell you everything you want to hear, and write back to their own life. True. Second, consistency. <coughs> they need you there when you say you're going to be there. And if, you, if they need you and you're not there, and you don't have a good reason why you're not there, it's over. And it might be one and done with them. You think, wow, that's a little harsh. Is it really? No. Because shouldn't God's people be the most stable people in the whole universe? Because we have a word that never changes, that we say that we proclaim. And if we're not being solid and secure, if we're not being faithful and we're not consistent, there's something wrong. Something majorly wrong. Ooh. Why is it our standard? Because we can build our life on it. And when the winds and the waves of life come crashing down, the Bible says you shall not be moved because you built your house upon the rock. The Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. This is a true statement. Most people when they fall into sin didn't have a purpose to get into sin. I didn't think the person said, hey, you know what? I'm going to go use heroin today. I think it's a good thing. Hey, I'm, I'm going to go beat my wife today. Hey, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go get rid of 30 years of sobriety because I just think I am just need a beer today. No, you know what happened? They quit praying. They quit reading. And the next thing you know is they're controlled by sin. When you pray up and you read up, guess what happens? Aren't you sensitive to those areas? Aren't you sensitive to life? Guess what you do? You cast those things. But if you're not praying and you're not reading then the next thing you know, you're get, being consumed by the ways of the world. You either fill your life with God or the world will fill you. When you study God's Word and incorporate His wisdom and principles into your daily life, your whole perspective will change. Elizabeth George. Your whole perspective will change. I have a lady here that God didn't change anything in her circumstance, but changed everything in her perspective. And her life is just like, wow. What a testimony. Life-changing. How many guys have really prayed for your, your living situation to change and nothing's changed a bit? Amen. Maybe it's not your circumstance that needs to change, but how you see it that needs to change. And you see it from God's perspective. It's not a problem. It's a blessing. You know why? Because even though it's not where you want to be, it's my, it might be where you need to be. Anyone else? It might be keeping you back from something worse. Do you know that's true? We like to thank God for all the good things. We don't realize that some of the things that seem to be problems is just, uh, just God keeping us back from worse things. So then we're like, how am I stuck here, God? And in his picture, you're He's thinking, well, you're stuck here because if you weren't stuck here, you'd be far worse. Yep. Ooh, now this is going to take a while for me to describe. The Bible contains testimony of people's experience with life and God, with God in life. David and Goliath facing big problems, and Jehoshaphat facing many problems. And I'll I'll get to this right now. I might spend some time here, so excuse me if I go overboard. But you're like this. When I read the Bible, it's not just a system of rules. As I shared yesterday at a ministry that was phenomenal. The Bible is for a believer. For a believer. The Bible is not a system of rules that we have to try. We have to try not to break. The Bible is full of promises that we are going to see fulfilled. 
This is the story of the Bible. This is the story that built up Abraham. Is that when he looked at the scriptures and what he was told by God, it wasn't that I can't do this. It's like, what are you going to do next? And that is what the Bible is to you and I. And it's full of testimony of people's experience with God. It's not just a system of rules. It's not just God saying, you commanding us, you can't do that. It's people that have daily struggles like you and I and God moved upon their life and brought about the supernatural and changed everything. And let's talk about David and Goliath. You're going to say, well, what is this story about? You know what the story's really about? Watch this. It's a story about somebody facing a problem much bigger than themselves. And in facing a problem much bigger than themselves, everybody else in Israel was avoiding the problem. Do you know that? Everybody else was avoiding the problem. This little shepherd boy said, you know what, enough's enough, and I'm going to stand against that problem. So David went out there and knew who stood with him. He went and found five smooth stones, and he went with his slingshot. And you know what else he went with experience? Not experience in who he is in, in his self, experience in what God can do. David said, hey, you come to me in this, in this great stature and all this arm, armor. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And what was David's experience based on? All the time shepherding, killing lion and bear, knew, knowing what God can do. So here's the picture. David stood against that problem much bigger than himself with five stones that were God-made and a sling that was man-made. And he slew the enemy. What is that? Participation with God. There it is. David participated with God and slew the enemy. Cut off his head and put it out as a spectacle of what God can do. So that the enemy didn't rule and reign in fear. David rose up by faith and took him down. What's that speak to us? How many of you are facing a problem bigger than yourself right now? And don't know how you're going to accomplish it. And thinking by avoiding the problem, you don't have to face it. But eventually that problem is going to continue to grow bigger than what you think. And eventually you have to face it anyways. And when you and God face that problem together, that problem will die before you. That's the story of David and Goliath. I know that there's a few here that needed to hear that story this morning. Hallelujah. Okay, let's talk about the other one. Jehoshaphat. Whew. Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's sitting there as king, man. And all of a sudden, this great big army comes against him. He's like, oh, man. You know what Jehoshaphat was facing? The multitude. You ever had too many problems? You, didn't, you ever had too many problems? You couldn't face just one? You began to get overwhelmed? Well, I'll go speak at another church that feels that way. <laughs> Anyways, here's what Jehoshaphat did. He declared a fast. Declared a fast. What's a fast? It's an opportunity to put our focus on God. He wasn't consumed with the multitude. He put a fast in so he can see what God can do. So that God could be his focus and not the battle. So this is what happened. Jehoshaphat fasted before the Lord and had the children of Israel fast. He got a word. And this is my favorite statement. In 2 Chronicles 20, 12. He said, Lord, we have no power against this great multitude, nor do we know what to do. But here's the key point. Our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. Sounds like Peter walking on water, right? As long as he was looking at Jesus, he was able to walk on water. The moment he got his eyes off, he began to sink. So this is what happened. The prophet, prophetic word came, which is a declaration that God was in it on their behalf. And he said, you don't have to worry about this great multitude. You go out and stand. So they're getting ready to fight. They put the, all the army together, and there's this hill they have to crest, and they put the worship team before the warriors. And as they crest the, wor the hill, they were in worship and praise. As they crested the hill, they looked down, and the army that they thought they were going to have to fight fought each other and killed each other off. You know what they were left to do? Go down the mountain and pick up all the spoils that were left behind. They didn't even need to fight. God fought it on their behalf. All they had to do was stand. 
Could it be that you're facing these great multitude of problems and issues in your life and it begins to get your focus instead of God? And if you put your attention on God, He'll slay the enemy without you having to put your finger to it? That's what I believe the Scripture is telling us. See how it relates today? The Bible is what? Living and powerful. You know how it's active? Because what happened over 2,000 years ago is still applicable today in what God can do to those who are struggling. To those who have no hope. Who, to those who are oppressed. Man, this word is powerful. Hmm. Mm. I won't be able to get all this out without screaming and yelling and jumping and foaming out the mouth. This book has the power to change lives. Change lives. That's what he wants. It's not just something you read. It's something that changes your whole life. This book changes lives. You know how powerful this book is? In some places in China, in the underground church, they take the Bible apart and they make things out of it so they could smuggle it in. And then they take those things apart and they put the Bible back together so they can have a powerful Word of God. So it can change their lives. We are so spoiled in California. We have access to the Word of God unlike almost anybody else in history in California. We have the best Bible teachers and the best colleges and we have all those things. And yet, people would rather turn on the TV that institutes death rather than read the Word of God that institutes life. Watch this. And because we have not been teaching the Word of God, our next generation has suffered death and not life. And look where we've been led into. And since we're on the subject, I don't care if this is out. It's almost open declaration to fight against abortion now. And if we need to fight, arm up. I'm sorry if that hurt you, but I'm, I can't. I can't. This word declares life. And life starts at conception. And I'm not letting it go. I'm going to stand on the my soapbox and I'm going to preach it. Amen. Because God wants life. And He wants our children to experience what He can do. And we're letting our world die by letting the enemy win because we're not living in the truth. Maybe this word can be preached so it would change our nation. Sounds like it needs to, huh? Hmm. Ah. Oh. It's important to be in God's Word. I say, hey, are you in God's Word? And people's like, yeah, man, I think it's super important. But don't you know it's more important to have God's Word in you? It's important for you to know what it says than for you to quote a verse. Do you know that the truth and the biblical principle is the most important thing about the Bible? Not you just quoting Scripture. That's why you've got to preach it in context. You've got to look at all Scripture. That's why going back to first or Second Timothy, it says all Scripture. He didn't say some Scripture, did he? Some Scripture is profitable. Only the ones that make you feel good are profitable. <laughs> Only the ones that put the emphasis on the sin that your neighbor's doing, not your sin. I heard a new term, spec eye. What the heck's a spec eye? You know, they always want to remove the speck out of somebody else's eye. No, it said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. You know what it says in 2 Corinthians 3.3? 3, 3? Oh, this is good. This is where the Bible needs to be. It says that we are epistles of Christ. Not written with ink, but written by the Holy Spirit. So let me, let me share... A practical statement about that. Ready? You ever, heard the, you ever heard the old phrase, I can read you like a book? That's what that means. That people could read our lives like reading Scripture. Like reading the Bible. That's where it needs to be. Not just reading it, but it needs to be in us. It needs to be our lifestyle. Psalm 119. 
Psalm 119. Yeah, that's the that's decay glitter, otherwise known as dust. And you know when things get dusty? When they're not used. Okay? Psalm 119. I should have marked these yesterday, but I was a little wound up after ministry yesterday. Say, so verse 9. Psalm 119, verse 9. What's it say? Many of you guys will know this. 119, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. What keeps us from sin? The word of God. Verse 11. Ready? You'll like this one. So I'm going to quote it in the right way. Ready? I'm going to quote it in the practical human way. Ready? Your word have I, or I have, hidden on my shelf that I might not sin against you. You know why I said that? Because many times that's what we do with it. How many of you guys ever had one of those family Bibles? The big giant family Bible. You know what that thing was for? Show. You put it on the coffee table. I'd rather see a Bible marked up, tore up, and everything that's in the Bible is hidden in somebody's heart than seeing it look pretty on a shelf. Because what is going to change your life? How good the Bible looks or how much the Bible brings change? It's a spiritual book that brings change. How do we get that change? By taking it off the shelf and putting it in our heart. What's your heart? It's not the physical muscle he's talking about. It's the center of everything that you are. It's the center of your will. Ready? It's, it's the very core of who you are. Okay? One more. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So, to sum all this up, there's a way that seems right to the man, but the end is death. Do you know without the Bible, we'd be walking in darkness, thinking what God wanted? Not knowing what God wants. We would, we would limit God speaking to us, even the Holy Spirit, to a bunch of unctions, so to speak, impressions. But we would have no standard to tell us that, that was, whether it was God or not. Whether it was God or not. And then we would be walking around with no direction or no clarity of living. You ever done that? You ever walked in darkness and stubbed your toe? The worst I ever stubbed my toe, it wasn't this last time fishing which cut off the whole, you know the callus right here? Cut off the whole callus and laid open. You know, I was standing on rocks in, uh, in uh, flip-flops. Don't do that. <laughs> but I went to go spank my daughter one time and she ran down the hallway and I went to go get her in my Right on the corner, my toe stubbed the corner of the wall. Oh, oh. You're supposed to spank your kids with no, dis, uh, with no anger. And I, I got to say, I sinned that day. <laughs> but if I don't have a lit up path, how can I know what I'm doing? Here's the truth. You know why people are swayed in the world? Because they live in darkness. And they don't really know what they do. You know why brothers and sisters sin against us? They backtalk us. They complain and whine because they don't know what they do. But the more we read this, the more we'll know what to do in response. We'll pray for them. We'll encourage them. We won't condemn them. We'll help them see the reality and the glory of God which will change their lives. You know why I preach this? Because this is truth. It's not just God's truth. It's my truth. I've seen supernatural things happen as I preach the word. I, I wish I could tell you, but I, I'd be preaching for days on this. I'd be preaching for days. One time, the very first time I was leading a youth group, and, and I taught a Bible passage, and this kid raised his hand because I let them ask questions afterwards. And this kid raised his hands, and I said, do you have a question? And he goes, no. I'm like, why are you raising your hand? He goes, I'm questioning. Very first kid I ever led to the Lord in the sinner's prayer. I said, you're questioning? He said, yeah. I want Jesus. I pray over, I'm getting ready to pray over that kid. 
he stands up, he points to four of his friends, and he goes, and you guys need it too, and they all got up. <laughs> Supernatural work of God's work. I've seen people sick unto death. God gave a word from Scripture. Boom, saw so I healed. I saw people so consumed in drugs and alcohol, there was never any hope. They never, ever had hope. Yet they would preach the word of God was preached to them, it gave them faith, and they came out of it. I've seen homeless people all of a sudden build lives. I've seen everything, almost everything except the dead rise yet, and I'm still waiting for that. I almost had a chance the other day. I had somebody in the back of my truck, and he was an awesome brother, man. But I was like, man, if I hit the right bump, maybe. But here's the truth. I love you, Norm. I love you, family. You're awesome. But the truth is, is that God can do it. But you know, he doesn't perform anything that's not in his standard. Do you know that? We might not understand some of the things and they need to be detailed out, but he does ne- the Holy Spirit never leads us anything into anything that's not scriptural in base. Does that make sense? So, we're going to take our offering and before we do, Here's the thing I want to describe to you. Many of you have a daily reading program. Many of you do not. Many of you read the Bible when, uh, when you get yourself into trouble. Some people have a hard time reading. Do you know that you can real easy go on a... If you have a smartphone, you can load Blue Letter Bible app, and it's free. And then you can actually, down at the bottom, it's got the, it's got the speaker emblem and it actually read for you? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, we have no excuse not to be in the Word. And I don't flip through the pages and think I find something and say, this is for me today. I have a systematic plan. You ever heard this? People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Here's the truth when it comes to reading Scripture, it's the same. If you don't have a daily plan, you're missing out. I have a daily plan, and it performs what God wants in my life. Sometimes the plan is reading a, a chapter. Sometimes the plan is doing a devotion with some other things. But that plan is what grew me up in the knowledge and the grace of God. You know what it says in Proverbs? My people perish for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Here's the thing. You don't want to eat what I regurgitate. This is, this, is, this is what I'm sharing. Ready? Why would you want to take my leftover spiritually when you can go to the source and get the fresh bread? You guys ever smelt fresh bread? Somebody's baking good fresh bread and you can just smell it in the oven and you're just all prepared and you're thinking, oh man, now I just need some good butter with it, you know? Nice and hot out of the oven and butter it up and all. Oh. How many of you guys like eating that one? Well, I, I did like eating that way. I've dropped, uh, I don't know how many. We're going to find out how much weight I've dropped after church. But anyways, the Bible, our spiritual book, is the same. It needs to be fresh. And the reason why I said regurgitate, I used to say it worse. My wife said, that's not a good picture you want people having. Here's the thing. I don't want to take your word for it. I don't want to take other preachers' word for it. I want to take it from the very word of mouth, ma- the word in the mouth of God. So, this is a vision I saw. I've shared this once before, but this is powerful. Okay, you ready? One day we were praying and I saw a wing. It looked like a bird's wing and it went past people and they were trying to breathe in the air that it left. The wind. But it wasn't a bird, it was an angel. And as it flew over, they were trying to breathe in the wind and I thought, oh man, is this, is this first... First principle, is this of God? Is this scriptural? And then I thought, okay, the wind is the Holy Spirit. So yeah, it'd be scriptural. But then this is the still small voice I heard. The thought that came into my mind. Ready? The angel wasn't leaving wind. He was carrying my breath. And as people breathed it in, it transformed their life. The breath of God, when it says all Scripture is inspired by God, the literal 
meaning of that passage is, is that all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. And by reading it and taking it in and living our life in that context, we would be built up in God's kingdom, not ours. You know what the good thing is in God's kingdom? I'll leave you guys with this. You can't have a kingdom without a king. If we're in the kingdom of this world, guess who our king is? If we're living in God's kingdom, guess who our king is? And if we're living in his kingdom and Jesus is our king, guess who our king isn't? Our king isn't the enemy. Our king is in ourselves. That's why there's so much freedom when we live in Christ. You guys agree with that? Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, so much for this opportunity to make you known. And as we read the word, we read about other people's testimonies that you're faithful. As we read the word, Lord, we see that there's a spiritual attachment that brings us life, brings us health. It even stirs up, Lord, godliness down to our bones. And as we read your word, Lord, it will crush and cast out all those other voices that are going off in our head and in this world. The ones that have twisted up our lives in the lie, God. And so that we could be set free. And as we're set free, we understand that your word calls us sons. Your word calls us saints. Your word calls us into impossibilities. And we say yes and amen. So Lord, may you be lifted up. May you drive us in to the knowledge of you. And once again, I just want to quote this. We read the Bible not to know the book. We read the Bible to know the author. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for worship.